Thank you very much for the invitation to give a talk here about observing the Arctic and uh, optical technologies for CIS or Arctic monitoring. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and I'm going to talk about the work that I do back home at the Alfred Wegener Institute, but also uh, together with colleagues like Marcel Baba at Takovic and under the framework of Sentinel North. So I first of all want to thank all these collaborators that have contributed to that work in the past years. So let's get started. And why are we interested in, in monitoring the, the CIS ecosystem? Well, we learned during the last decade that uh, CIS has changed dramatically. So CIS got younger, it got thinner, uh, there are more melt ponds on it, so CS is on the way of disappearing. What we also learned is that the optical properties of the CS changed dramatically and that nowadays there is much more light coming down to the base of the CIS and much more light available within the ice that, heat, that heats up the ocean, that heats up the ice and causes melt. So this change in light obviously affects the associated sea ice ecosystem from small unicellular alg algae over zooplankton, fish, seals, up to the top predator, the polar bear. And it's even linked to what is happening in the deep sea. But it is slightly unclear how these links exactly work. And that is one of the reasons why we need to look into monitoring the Arctic system to understand what is going on. So when monitoring the Arctic system, we're dealing with a lot of technological challenges in the polar regions. So the first problem is usually access to the field because in the central Arctic, it's really hard to get to and there's really not that many icebreakers available for uh, ice going research. Then it's a very dynamic environment. So the ice is moving around. And as you see here on the top right picture, easily you can get your equipment uh, crushed by some pressure ridge formation and then your nice expensive radiometers obviously don't do what they're designed to do anymore. Then there's the problem of problem of wildlife. So we have uh, polar bear, for example, they they are very curious animals and they, they like to investigate our stations. And sometimes they are just curious and sometimes they really destroy the entire station and then also our monitoring capabilities are lost. But already if these external factors are not there, the climate is, is really harsh, so running a, a system successfully is, is challenging. Data telemetry as well, uh, getting the data home is really expensive. And then if we are talking about more complicated platforms like uh, gliders or so, they are very limited navigation capabilities. So we can't use everything that we are no, known to use from the open ocean. And after all, operating sensitive electronics in this harsh and dynamic environment is always a big challenge. So I want to quickly mention two recent initiatives that I have been personally involved in. And one is the, the FRAM program by the Alfred Wegener Institute, uh, which is called Frontiers in Arctic Marine Monitoring. And there we were developing a lot of, of autonomous monitoring stations to be, be, be deployed on sea ice to observe how the ice is changing and to get data when we are not around. On the other hand, you might have heard about the Mosaic expedition, uh, which happened during the last year. And uh, this is where our German research icebreaker Polarstern froze itself into uh, one of the ice flows drifting through the Arctic with plenty of scientists on. So there was a very extensive scientific program and this enabled us to really follow the flow over the course of an entire year and monitor how things are changing. Of course, these are two very different uh, approaches to, to monitoring and both have their advantages and disadvantages. So I wanted to quickly play you uh, a, a movie. And why does this not play now? No. Um, showing you what we are doing, for example, with underwater robots. And these are some impressions from our work in 2018 in the last ice area of the Canadian Forces Station Alert. And you see how we deploy a complicated ocean robot in these 
uh, this harsh environment to investigate the physics and optical properties of the water and the ice from underneath. Here you see the robot diving underneath first flat first year ice and now under very deformed and, and thick um, multi-year ice. So these novel tools really help us to look at the ice. Uh, not only to understand what directly the ROV sensors measure, but also to look at uh, some other sensors like here, a light sensor that we deployed or some sonars to understand how they are measuring. And these robots have given us a new set of eyes underneath the ice cover. So why particular are we using this ROV? And here on the right side, you can, you can see the ROV that, that we are using. And you can see we have this big multitude of sensors on it. And I don't want to go into detail on all of them, but uh, if you see here on the left top side, you see an aerial image of a uh, typical ice flow. And typically you go and you drill an ice core at one location and you assume it's representative for what you're doing, but actually you already see from the air that the ice is varying dramatically on a horizontal scale. And that's why with an ROV, we are able to cover this spatial variability and learn much more about how, for example, the optical properties change over time. And this is one of the results that we generated uh, with a remotely operated vehicle underneath the ice. This is from uh, six expeditions over the course of, of many years. And here on, on the x-axis, you see uh, the time of, of the year from the beginning of June to the end of October. And each of these colored uh, bars that represents an entire day of work on the sea ice. And this is a uh, basically a color-coded histogram of the of the transmittance optical transmittance of the sea ice so you can see that there are stations where we have rather high average transmittance and also a very long tail of high transmittance through for example ponds but you can also nicely see how towards the end of the season the light transmittance of the sea ice is decreasing vastly again while in spring for example it really depends on the region uh, what is going on well in some regions uh, it slowly starts creeping up and in other regions you already have early on some some melt pond formation so these are not uh true time series observations these colored bar only these horizontal lines they are some some from some autonomous stations but still they they give us some a hint of what's going on and now on mosaic we have the chance to investigate this in more detail another thing that we are busy with are these autonomous stations and they are part of something what's called the international arctic buoy program which is an international WMO driven program. And maybe the most famous feature of this program is that all the data of these data buoys, and you see them here on the left, our buoy deployments from the past seven years, <clears throat> that they deliver the data directly onto the GTS and that goes into your personal weather forecast uh, live edge. This has so far mostly been focused on the physical parameters, but in the last years we have <clears throat> also tried to extend that um, to use bio-optical sensors to learn more about uh, the light field, about the, the optical properties, about chlorophyll uh, concentration in the water, etc. And I will show you one uh, novel uh, device that we came up with during this later. So we put these massive drifting observatories into the Arctic. This here is a Woods Hole ITP system combined with many other buoy systems. And those then give you really nice uh, year-long data sets of what has been going on. And you can see, for example, here you see the snow height <clears throat> and the blue color, you have the overlaying ice, sea ice transmittance. So you can see how the ice transmittance goes up as soon as the snow starts melting. And then you see there is significant light in the water column, which then later on uh, causes some, some chlorophyll uh, algae growth in the water column. So these platforms really are great tools for observing the sea ice ecosystem. 
As I already said, we are using some of these uh, radiation stations that measure incoming and reflected uh, light, particular albedo and transmittance throughout the entire year. And they have been around for quite some time, but now we developed a new tool and this is a, a vertical string of light sensors that penetrates uh, through the ice and you can see here in the bottom left an animation of its measurement. You can see the, the light deteriorating from the surface down uh, to the bottom over the course of the spring. And this first of all allowed us to also fill some gaps when Polarstein had to leave the mosaic experiment this spring. Uh, due to logistics and, and corona reasons, our autonomous stations were able to stay back. But we could also observe some algal growth on the chain and even some uh, changes in the properties of this algae growing on, on this chain. So, as I said, we have been doing in the past a lot of manual drilling or physical investigations, and there are by now quite some observations of apparent optical properties, and both of them feed uh, into climate models to improve the understanding of our Earth system. However, the problem is that in, in these models there is if so, only a very weak link between the physical properties and the optical properties. And while, while our, especially ocean scientists are very good at ready to transfer modeling from inherent optical properties to apparent optical properties, for sea eyes we really uh, have a lack of understanding these inherent optical properties and, and how they are related to the physical uh, properties. So we have been recently investigating more into in sea ice measurements with novel observation technologies to get a better handle on these inherent optical properties and provide these links. So to provide a more solid integration into climate models. Uh, one of these examples is the, the sea ice endoscope son that uh, we developed at, at Takovic and you basically see me here with a prototype on uh, the Canadian ice in, in Baffin Island and what you basically do you shoot a laser into the ice <clears throat> and then record the strength of the laser at a number of, of distances away of that and with some advanced relative transfer modeling you can come back to the the IOP directly measured in the ice so these here on the right side are some fresh new measurements from uh, the mosaic expedition so we are actually able to measure the optical properties of sea ice in situ right now to conclude i want to talk a little bit about how does this arctic monitoring at all benefit the society because this all seems very uh, technically but it's all linked up to, to la the larger course so sea ice is a means and a hindrance to travel so both Inuit travel on it use it to travel but also it hinders uh, transportation so understand the movements of sea ice is very important to be able to predict these these travel patterns also the ice associated ecosystem provides significant ecosystem services to uh, to the ocean and the, the the communities nearby. So it is crucial to understand these to to put the right value on on the ecosystem. Also, our measurements in the in the blast pristine areas of our planet allow us to in, to inform decisions about the protection of of last pristine areas and. Uh, particular last ice area has shown how how this research can be uh, benef beneficial to to determine these protection areas. Then, of course, understanding the ice is important for the safe shipping observations, both for trade and tourism. And also, it is as I've shown you our uh, remote autonomous observation stations. They provide crucial information, even for the weather forecasting, just your normal day, day weather forecasting. Because if you don't know the pressure fields in the Arctic, then you can't do a proper weather forecast for Central America or, or Europe either. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to receive your questions later on. Thanks a lot.